Yeah, after all that, Paul said, uh, <laughs> do I still have a message to preach after that? You know, I, I really, I don't take it for granted. I appreciate the flexibility to be able to, to be able to just share something like that and just take a moment or two when, before we pray and before we give to talk about Father's Day or talk about giving or talk about whatever. And uh, just that, the ability to, to flow with that and maybe hopefully follow the Holy Spirit in that. So, yes, I do have a, uh, I do have a main message. I want to jump right into it. So let's do this. Uh, the Bible, inspired by the Spirit of God, calls itself the mind of Christ, calls itself the sword of the Spirit, says that it is, it is discerned and appraised by spiritual men and women, spiritual men and women, meaning that the unbelieving world is not going to understand it, just as it's not going to understand you, Jamie, and men and women who are walking in the flesh, by means of the flesh, empowered by their own flesh, uh, concerned purely with worldly things, they're not going to understand it either, and they're not going to understand you tomorrow. But here's the, here's the point about when we come together to worship God in spirit and in truth, we need the spirit to get to the truth. Are you tracking with that? You have the gift of the Holy Spirit within you, but sometimes while we have all of him, he doesn't have all of us. And this, at, at a very minimum, this is the moment when you should be surrendered, sold out, and yielded to him. Shauna, what does the Holy Spirit want to say and what does he want to do in this moment? That's our attitude. If it's not, listen, you're wasting your time. I'm the only pastor who's ever going to tell you that. I'm the only person I've ever heard say, if, if you don't want to worship God and you don't love God, you have no desire for his word, you might as well just be somewhere else on Sunday morning. I've never heard anybody else say that. I'm not bragging about it. I simply, I never heard anybody else be that brutally honest about it. it. If it's just a social construct or just a habit I've gotten into to show up at some building on a Sunday morning, you're wasting your time if you don't want God. I don't really have a message for people who don't want God, Bruce. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know what that message is, really. I, I have no desire to learn that message, but we need the Holy Spirit. And so in this moment, we're going to pray, Spirit of the living God, come fill us by your power and your presence, but open the riches of your word. Show us. We, I don't know about you. When I, uh, when I am listening to someone teach and or preach, I want to feast around the banquet table of grace. I don't want a morsel. I don't want like a, I don't like a cookie, right? I want the whole sheet cake. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I want the whole thing, man. All the ladies are like, oh, yeah, I know that. I, know that. I do, too. I do. German chocolate. I mean, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. The whole thing. So that's what, that's what, that's what I want. That's what I want when, I, when I'm here. Part of the problem is, part of the problem is we, just, we don't know how to be taught anymore. We don't understand that environment. We are used to, if you come from a background that someone's constantly preaching at you, right? Or just preaching the gospel, even if it's an accurate gospel, just preaching the gospel. That's wonderful, and that's a part of my overall uh, theology and message. It's a huge part, the cross, resurrection, ascension of Jesus Christ. However, it's not the only part. And so as we walk through the scriptures and walk through what these might look like as we live them out, there's a whole lot more. There's a whole lot more. And sometimes I just think we're just not used to being taught, Linda. We're just not, we don't, we're not used to the Bible being taught. We're used to somebody preaching it and or preaching at us or sermonizing or any number of things except for sound biblical teaching. But that's what I do. And that's what I'm gifted to do. I am a shepherd teacher, a pastor teacher. That's my gift. So the key to all of this, again, Kim, is the Holy Spirit. No matter what level of, of uh, life we're at, what phase of growth, what stage we're in, in the masculine or feminine journey, wherever we are in all of this, the Holy Spirit can speak to us, and he can give us something in this moment. No matter where you are, again, uh, he can give you something that you can gnaw on and take with you, a piece of meat to chew on, right? You say, well, but I need some milk. You'll get some milk, too. It'll be all right. It'll all balance out in the end. I don't believe in teaching to the lowest common denominator. I don't like that idea, and I think it's ridiculous. There are people here who have been around a long time and have heard a lot of great Bible teachers, and they need to be fed as well. So we're, we're, we're covering the whole spectrum. You with me? Father, we ask you now to move and to work and to shape us deeper and deeper into your image, more and more into your likeness. Jesus came and put a human face on you, Baba. We can call you Father because of his work on the cross. Bridge that gap through faith in his finished work. We have been adopted into your family and we belong to you eternally, forevermore. No one can ever separate us. No one can take us out of your hands. 
We're grateful for that. We thank you for that. We ask you, Holy Spirit, now to come and to move among us. We ask you to fill us, fill us to overflowing with your presence and your power so that our minds are alive, our emotions are stimulated, our intellect, every part of us is engaged in this process. Reveal the riches of your word. and Show us maybe where we have wandered off track, even if it's just mentally. I, just, I don't understand how this whole thing works. What's my priority scale supposed to look like? Well, reprioritize it for us this morning and show us what is truly important. In the name of the Son of God, we pray. Amen? All right. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7. What, he, what I did last week was just paint a picture for you in verses 1 through 6, and we're actually, we're actually heading for verses 8 and 9. That's, that's kind of the centerpiece of this, and there's some... I believe this is one of the most powerful and profound lessons in all the New Testament, right here in this little section, especially in verses 8 and 9, uh, but actually in, ver- in verses 7 through 9, but uh, Paul has this just amazing list of achievements, listen to me, achievements and accomplishments in the flesh, okay, things that were his before he came to Christ. Now, I want you to understand, because I just, I just get the sense a lot of times that, that we use a lot of biblical language and we don't really understand what that language means. When you hear me say things like, like uh, the energy of the flesh or the power, the strength of the flesh, I, I am talking about the sinful nature, yes, but I'm not just talking about sin that comes forth. I'm talking about anything you can accomplish apart from the Holy Spirit. There's, there's, there are two terms that are used that contrast uh, two types of people in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And one of them is, one of them is, uh, is spiritual, and one of them is, it depends on your translation, fleshly or worldly, right? Or carnal would be the old King James language. And we go, well, I don't understand. Carnal. Uh, incarnation, carne, meat, in the flesh, that idea. Listen, here, let, me, let me just pull it back a little bit, maybe pull the curtain open and, and show you what that really means. Those two terms uh, end in the Greek in the, in, the, in the suffix ikos, ekos. And ekos simply means not just what something is made of, in other words, made of flesh or made of spirit. It means something that is enabled and empowered by this. So when we talk about someone who is fleshly or worldly, sarkikos, we're talking about those who are enabled and empowered by their flesh. Does that make sense? When we talk about someone who is spiritual, pneumatikos, pneumatikos, pneuma being the word for spirit, we're talking about people who are enabled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Vast difference between the two. You can do a lot in human energy. You can get a lot accomplished. You can... Uh, mow and weed eat and do and, you know a whole property the, the size of this one you know as, as several of us did yesterday. Thank you to all the men who were out here. It wasn't a big crowd, but it was exactly who needed to be here because if if everybody hadn't showed up, we would have been in bad shape. One of the riding mowers went down immediately, and someone else brought another one and 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 knocked out a, a huge portion of this. So uh, anyway, it worked out well, and I'm I'm deeply grateful. You can do all kinds of stuff, though. I mean, we see it out here in the world. You can accomplish and achieve all kinds of things uh, in the flesh that don't necessarily look sinful. They just don't have any connection to the will, plan, and purpose of God, to his kingdom. Okay? Were you with me on that? Spiritual. You could even go to church. You can even open the Bible. You can even sit in the middle of uh, a worship service. Right? All kinds of things. Now, in order for us to understand verses 8 and 9, which I think is the key here, we need to look at Paul's mindset, at what he was thinking at this moment in verse 7. So after running down, after running down, if you, if you want to pull up Philippians 3, maybe we can scroll through this as I'm kind of highlighting this. After running down the roster of privileges inherited by him at birth, inherited by him, his circumcision on the eighth day, the purity of his lineage as an Israelite. If you want a deeper understanding of these things he's talking about, go back and listen to last week's uh, message because I went through them in detail. His aristocratic descent from the tribe of Benjamin. His cultural background as a true Hebrew, trained in the rituals and traditions and heritage of his Hebrew forefathers. Untainted by Hellenistic culture and yet well-versed in the language of Hellenism. Also of Aramaic, which was the common language in Palestine. And of the classical Hebrew in which the Old Testament was written. He then lists his own personal achievements in the Jewish faith. So he had four things that were his by means of birth. Okay, just like you might say, well, blonde hair, blue eyes, you know, this height, this build, this whatever. I got those things from birth. But when it comes to business and it comes to sports and it comes to something else, I'm a self-made man, right, or self-made woman. The problem with a self-made man is that he worships his creator. 
That's the problem. Uh, did you get that? These are his overwhelming credentials under Judaism. So he's got three things. He's got seven things here, four that he inherited by birth, three that he accomplished on his own, Marshall, and these are one, that he was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee, which meant that he had mastered all the finer points, all the details, all the rules and regulations and restrictions, which the Mosaic law and the oral tradition of the Jewish rabbis could impose. A man who had devoted every aspect of life to the rigorous observance of religion. Religion. Secondly, that in his zeal, in his ardor and fervency in defending Judaism, he had persecuted Christians. In the name of God, he had persecuted the true followers of God. He had thrown them into prison, even hounded them to the death. And this was the proof under Judaism as an unbeliever of his dedication to God. And third, that under the self-righteous standards of legalism, he was faultless. That's the phrase, faultless, right? No one could bring a charge against him. That doesn't mean he was perfect, by the way, and it doesn't mean he was sinless, David. It means nobody could make it stick. He was the Teflon Pharisee, right? Nobody could bring a charge and make it stick. That's all that means is you're really good at hiding what goes on inside your own soul. And that's what that means. Uh, according to the law, the outward standards, according to the Mosaic law, according to legalism, he was faultless. He was faultless. As far as anyone could see, he was blameless in the eyes of the world and in the, the eyes of other Jews. In light of all of this, he says in verse 7, but, using the conjunction Allah, A-L-L-A, to paint the strongest possible contrast between two things, in contrast to the purity of my lineage and ancestry, to my lofty and aristocratic background, and to my attainments and achievements in the faith of my forefathers, whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of of Abba's anointed. That's the Reverend Rick expanded translation. Paul's word for prophet in verse 7 is kerdos, K-E-R-D-O-S, kerdos. It's a business term used in the ancient world to denote an advantage, right? A financial gain, a gain. It could be any kind of gain, but a gain of some kind. Loss, I call this section profits, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, and losses. You'll get that. Accounting people will get that. Profits and losses. That phrase, look at the phrase whatever, because that's emphatic in the sentence. That is emphatic in the Greek. It's the exact same construction as the prophets that he's just spoken of. And it refers back to all of the privileges and accomplishments mentioned in verses 4 through 6. It goes back to all these gains. It's not just a, I mean, when we say, when we say whatever, whatever, that means in, our, in, in 21st century English, that means absolutely nothing, that word. Someone says something to you, and you go, whatever. But the whatever here has a very distinct meaning. All, those, all the, that roster, things I just mentioned from his heritage and his background, all of his achievements, all the gains and advantages that Paul had accrued, that's the whatever. It refers explicitly to whatever things he once considered profitable in the human realm. All of his status symbols in the nation of Israel. You know what Paul's demonstrating here? He is demonstrating the viewpoint of a mature child of God. A mature child. Not a baby. Right? Not someone that Jesus has to drag, sometimes kicking and screaming, right, into the kingdom or into his way. But a mature child of God, Bruce, when he says a mature child of Abba, when he says that this treasure that he amassed in the strength of his flesh, this, this glowing review, this would have been, I mean, this is, this is, these are impeccable credentials under Judaism. Impeccable. This is like that... Uh, that resume that you put together where you skip about three or four jobs that maybe you got canned from or things didn't work out the way you wanted and you put, the, you put the only the highlights of all, you know, the glowing reviews. And you, you know, isn't it funny? And we, I have people call me all the time and say, well, I've got this new job coming up. Can you, can you, give, me, can you give me a reference or whatever? And, and you know, I, I usually say yes, but, you know, I'm going to be honest if they call me. And I don't know if you want that or not, but most people, what we do is we, we ask for people that were like, well, they don't know me well enough to know, you know, how I really work on the job. So I, I just want the people that kind of know me a little bit. And if they give me a reference, say, well, they're a really nice person. They work well with people, blah, 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 whatever. You know, that's what we're looking for. We usually don't call the most honest people we know to give us a recommendation for a job. Right? Right? You don't, you wouldn't, most of you would not, would not. Right, you wouldn't call your mom and dad. You wouldn't say, "Hey, yeah, give me give me a reference." They they know your. They looked at your bedroom all those years when you were growing up. They know uh, your work ethic. I'm just saying we're not. We don't ask the most honest people normally. 
listen, this was a glowing review in the eyes of the nation. He says he considers loss for the sake of Christ. You see, what the Judaizers, who are, who are Judaizers? Let's clarify that term just very quickly while we're here. There are, there are a group of men who have come from Jerusalem who have come out of Judaism. Many of them were part of the, many of them maybe have been, they were priests, they were part of the Sanhedrin, they were part of the official uh, religious structure of Jerusalem in the first century. So they have come out of Judaism, and they have been under what kind of law? The Mosaic Law. The, all, the, the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, they've lived by that. They have tried to meticulously observe it. Not only, Don, not only the, the Mosaic Law as it's written, but the oral traditions of the rabbis, which took the law and parsed it out into thousands upon thousands of little regulations. There is a way that you have to wash your hands. If you're going to ceremonially wash your hands uh, before, you, before you eat anything, you, you, have to, um, you have to wash your hands with at least, it's like, a, call it three quarters of an eggshell of water, and you have to pour the water this way so that the water runs down all the way to the wrist. But then, because the water has touched your hands, which were impure, the water's now impure, and it may be trickling down this way, so you have to turn the hand this way, pour more water on so that it will wash that impure water away and drip off this way. Are you, are, I, I kid you not. Are you following that? There's a prayer for cheese, a prayer for meat, a prayer for milk, a prayer for fish, a prayer for eggs, a prayer for prayer. For, it's like, dude, let's just eat, man. Can we just thank God? Thank you for this bread. Thank you for this meat. Thank you, Lord. Let's eat, right? I mean, can we just get to it? Wow, man. You know, when it, I mean, really, when we have a, a meal of some kind, that's not a time for world peace and all the things that are going on in your family and in your head. Just why don't, you, why don't we just thank God for his provision? Wow, this is really gracious. This is wonderful. Thank you. Now, while it's hot, we'll eat it. And God will say, good job. That's what I intended. Eat it while it's hot, man. You know, enjoy it, right? Just came out of the oven. Get after it. They are meticulous observers of the law, Judaizers. Not only, not only that, but they have, they have now come to faith in Christ. The book of Acts testifies to us that many of the priests were coming to the faith. Many of the priests, these are the ones who are slaughtering animals in the temple. They are all of the ritual and foreshadowing of Jesus' work. They're involved in it. And they have now come, they have now come to Christ and realized this is the Messiah. This is the chosen one, the promised one, the anointing one, etc. And so, but they brought all of this stuff with them. But you've never brought any stuff with you into the Christian life, have you? Or any stuff with you into a relationship or any stuff with you into a marriage, Right? Yeah, oh, it's all just gone. I just floated away. I woke up this morning, and I was just, ah, oh, just free. It's all gone, <laughs> right? Now, they brought all this with them, and so they started saying, they came from Jerusalem, and they went to the places where Paul was preaching the gospel of grace, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. And they said, well, yes, but you guys might want to get, in fact, you have to get circumcised in order to get saved. Now, this is, again, a foreign people, who don't have circumcision as a part of their life, their ritual, their, their whatever. you got to get circumcised to get saved. Wouldn't hurt you now that you are circumcised to go ahead and keep the law. And, on, on, I mean, they just, they're imposing all this stuff. I love Paul in several different places. Even to Peter says, listen, you and our forefathers couldn't keep the law, and yet you want to impose the law on a people to whom it was never given. You couldn't keep it. What makes you think they can? And even to Peter, he says, listen, you've been set free by the grace of Peter of all people. Remember the vision that he had in the book of Acts where the, this, this, this blanket basically comes, comes down from heaven in this vision and it has all these unclean animals on it. And the voice says, kill and eat. Oh no, Lord. Well, I mean, it's not like some of us. We're more righteous than God. Oh no, Lord, I would never. I have never eaten anything unclean. And God says, listen, what I've considered clean, let no man consider unclean. In other words, I've just given you a whole new a whole new buffet to choose from, right? Why do we eat? Why do we eat all these different animals? Well, if they weren't, if if God didn't want us to eat them, He wouldn't have made them so tasty. That's my view on the whole thing. So He's got a whole new buffet now. He's got all these new animals to choose from, and He says this. And, and but that that was just a picture. That was just an image. Because pretty soon, within within a matter of moments, He's going to go downstairs, and there are going to be some men who have come from another place, from Cornelius and. Cornelius, the centurion's home, they're coming because Cornelius also had a vision and said, go to Joppa and send for a man named Simon Peter and ask him to come here. And so he's going to the house of a, a Gentile. 
So Paul actually is not the first one to go to the Gentiles. Peter was the first apostle to go to the Gentiles. And he gets, he gets these men say, you know, would you come with us? And he's had this vision, and, he's, and the Holy Spirit says, go with him. And he goes with him, and he gives the gospel to the Gentiles, to a Roman centurion, and his entire house, and all of his slaves for it, everybody in his household. And they not only believe, they begin to speak in tongues, which is they begin to speak in languages, they, they praise God. The reason that that was given to them, it's like a Gentile Pentecost, because the Jews had to see it for themselves. I believe that God gave them that Gentile Pentecost in Cornelius' home so that the Jews could see God not only saved them and has given them the same grace that he gave us in Jesus, but he has poured out his Holy Spirit on them. And they say it. When Peter tells the story, he says, just like he did for us at the beginning. At the beginning of what? At the beginning of this age on the day of Pentecost when he poured out his Holy Spirit. He's done it again here for these Gentiles. In other words, there is no difference in the body of Christ between Jew and Gentile, black and white, male or female, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. There is no difference. We are on equal footing before the cross of Jesus Christ. We are, under, we are under the same grace, right? We're given the same power and the same Holy Spirit. We're given the same word to learn from. All these things. So here's, here's Peter knows all of this, and at one point in time, he, he is, he's having, you know, ham, bacon, and tomato sandwiches with his buddies. I mean, they're, they're, having, they're having a pork fest, and I don't know if they were having that, but that would be one thing that they, you know, the one new thing that would, I mean, imagine the first Jew to taste bacon. It would be like, Man, where's this been all my life? <laughs> Holy smoke, this is good. He's like, why, why, why have I waited so long? But he, he, but he is. He's he's eating with the Gentiles. But then some of these men come from from James and the group in Jerusalem, and he starts to he starts to back up, back away. Oh my gosh, my, I don't I don't want to hang out with the Gentiles and everything. And Paul says to him, How is it that you, who live like a Gentile, now he says this to Peter, How is it that you who live like a Gentile are compelling Gentiles to live like Jews. You following that? Because that's a pretty that's a pretty straightforward but brilliant logic. How is it that you who live like, you are a Jew who live like a Gentile? Why is it you are trying to compel Gentiles to live like Jews? And then he says the same thing that Peter said himself in Acts chapter 15. You are trying to impose a yoke or a burden on these people that neither we nor our forefathers could bear. That yoke has been broken, by the way, the bondage of law has been broken by the cross of Jesus Christ. Your IOU is canceled. You don't owe anymore. You don't live under that slavery. How many people? I mean, wouldn't it change things? Wouldn't it really, truly change things? Not just, not just intellectually or theologically, but literally and practically, if we believed that we were free in the Son of God, that our debts had been canceled, we truly were forgiven, and that we truly were loved, Beth, by Abba, by our Daddy. We were loved just as we are, and not even as we should be. We were loved right here and right now, in this place, in this moment, infinitely, unerringly, and that there was nothing that we would ever do to change the heart of our Father in that way. If we believe that, we could become anything. We could do anything or be anything. And see, the people I just described, those are the Judaizers. Coming in there, imposing legalism and a religion on people that have been set free by the grace of God, and what the Judaizers considered tremendous advantages Paul's whole heritage there in verses uh, 4 through 6, over the rest of the world, even the rest of their nation, Paul said they are really disadvantages in the kingdom of grace. This is the attitude you and I will naturally take as a result of spiritual momentum in the kingdom of God, that of full-grown sons and daughters willing to follow in their master's footsteps. This attitude, which is willing to take all the treasures that we've amassed in the strength and energy and ability of the flesh and count them as a loss for the sake of Christ. When Paul writes, I now consider, I now consider, he uses the perfect middle indicative of hegeomai, H-E-G-E-O-M-A-I, hegeomai. Don't glaze over yet. There's more to come, okay? I just heard my first Greek, and I'm like, Ugh. don't glaze over yet. Hegeomai means to add up, to add everything up and come to a conclusion. This is a thinking term. To add everything up and come to a conclusion. To take the divine realities of the word in your soul. If you don't have much word in your soul, you can't reach too many conclusions. Scripture is the language the Holy Spirit uses to speak to us. So we need the word of God in our hearts. It means to take those divine realities and draw a conclusion based on eternal perspective. 
eternal perspective. Not temporal, not human viewpoint, but divine. Not a temporal perspective, but an eternal one. Listen, there aren't a handful of, there aren't a handful of believers in the United States that live that way. I mean, I mean I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit, but in, in any given church, in, in, at any given moment, or the people who are a part of that body of believers consider themselves part of that community, there aren't a, there aren't a handful in, in every church in the United States that actually live from an eternal perspective. They're looking beyond what is, you know, this very moment, what's important to me now, what do I need in this moment, whatever. They're willing to do Listen, what Paul's doing here, this is not super spirituality. This is not only apostle type stuff. This is the attitude, Don, that we are going to uh, appropriate and approximate if we're walking in Jesus' footsteps. We will embrace this kind of mindset. That all these things that I think are so important, all these things that I have done, this is nothing compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. It's not only that, there's a, there's a strong term he's going to use down here a little bit later, uh, rubbish, and it ain't the garbage, I can tell you that. Now listen, profits and losses, profit, loss, those are business terms. That's what we do in business. Trying to make a profit, you take a loss, sometimes you sell things at a discounted price so that you can, uh, you can put more inventory in that will sell so that you can make a profit. Those are business terms. Hey, get my is an accounting term. An accounting term. Adding up all the facts and coming to a conclusion. In math, it's, that's pretty simple. I, I mean, my buddy Ford, that's why he loves math. Listen, if the, if the numbers are accurate, no reason why you can't have a rock-solid uh, answer out here in, in reality. If you have all the information you need, math is going to come out the same way every time. That's the way, that's the way that it works. I don't really like math, but I, I like that aspect of math. The fact that, it, that if, you have a, if you have an accurate input and you interpret the facts you have, you're going to get the same answer. Anywhere in the world, anybody, who, uh, anybody who's working on that particular equation. Listen, perfect, middle, indicative. What does that mean? The indicative mood is the mood of reality. Not potential or possibility, but reality. Paul now saw all those things which used to be gains and advantage to him in the temporal realm as worthless in the spiritual. The middle voice is kind of, a, in the Greek, is what we would call maybe a reflexive voice. So the, uh, the subject, in this case, Paul's the one who's doing the counting and the considering. He is not only participating in the action, he is benefiting from it. Are you following that? That's a reflexive nature. You participate in it, you benefit from it. It's kind of like, uh, we'll call it uh, exercising, right? We'll call it, uh, call it reading reading something that is engaging mentally, right? You are involved in the action. You're also benefiting from it, right? And you need to stay engaged. You should, you should be reading something that challenges you, that, uh, that instructs you, that uh, maybe lifts your spirits, but also your vocabulary every day, every day. Engage your brain. Get involved in the process, right? Read, study. I mean, I, I'm, I'm learning constantly. I keep about five or six different windows open on my browser when I'm at work, and there may, be, there may be an article, you know, I don't know what, a spiritual article on one. There may be a speech by Elizabeth Warren or Rand Paul or whomever on another one. Uh, there, I mean, there may be any number of things out there that I'm switching around from, but I want to I wanna stay engaged. I want to know what's going on, but I want to learn every day, and I want to grow every day. Above all, grow spiritually every day. But that's, that's kind of the idea. You're participating in, but you're benefiting from in the same way. That's the middle voice. And it shows him oriented to reality. It shows him benefiting personally and spiritually from this mindset. He's the winner, Linda, because with his eyes on the prize and his heart in tune with the mind of Christ, he can see all those things for what they truly are. Perfect tense, that refers to action that's complete at a point of time in the past with results that continue into the present. So we finish something back there. I mean, this is a rough analogy, but okay, so yesterday... We finish the property around here, try to get it to look good. And the result of that is that today, it does look good, right? That would be, that would be a perfect tense concept. Finish back here with results that continue into the present. That would be a similar idea. In other words, Paul is saying, in my own spiritual growth, I came to a point of considering my background, my status symbols, and my achievements in the flesh as a disadvantage, a total loss. And to this day, I regard them as worthless because of Christ. Paul took these seven phenomenal things in the eyes of the world, especially the Jewish world in the first century, 
And after much consideration, after weighing them out in his mind, he added all of them up. And in the business language of the Roman world, came to the conclusion their sum total was less than zero. Now, did you, did you see that when we scrolled through it? Did you hear those things? His, the aristocracy of his, of his tribe, Benjamin, that's the tribe from which the first king came, one of the only tribes to survive uh, when the ten northern tribes were carried away. Judah and Benjamin remained in the south, so they were the only ones when they returned from the Babylonian captivity to be absolutely sure of the purity of their lineage and their background. Circumcised on the eighth day, that's a true Israelite of the people of Israel, a term that a Jew would use when he wanted to emphasize the unique nature of his relationship with Yahweh. He called himself an Israelite, not descended from Esau or Abraham or Isaac, but Jacob, Israel. All of these things. Pharisee is like being a Navy SEAL in the Old Testament law. I mean, these are the elite of the elite. This is like a doctor, literally a PhD. The entrance exam is, is uh, memorizing the first five books of the Old Testament. Why don't you try memorizing the first five verses of any book in the New Testament? And then get back to me when you've done that, right? First five books, books, scrolls, scrolls. They knew them backwards, forwards, sideways. These are the experts in the law. All of these things, right? I was so zealous that I persecuted the church of God. I killed people who were worshiping God in the name of God, believing I was serving God. As far as the law was concerned, blameless, faultless. Can't pin anything on me. Nothing. And all of this is a loss. Loss, by the way, Zemia, Z-E-M-I-A, that's singular. All of these Profits, gains, advantages, all the various gains and advantages of his life as an unbeliever are considered as one loss. One loss which pales in comparison to knowing Jesus of Nazareth. All his human achievements had to be laid aside in order to accept the gift of grace. If he had depended on any of those things, listen to my question. If Paul had been depending on any of those things to help him a little bit in his salvation or even in his spirituality, is that grace? If it's, a, if it's a whole lot of the cross, but also a little bit of law or a little bit of me, is that, is, that, is that real faith? That's faith plus. Faith plus. Faith plus a little bit of works. Faith plus a little bit of flesh. Faith plus whatever. My background, my heritage, my achievements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's faith plus something. And it's not faith plus something. It's grace alone through faith alone in Christ Jesus alone. In our spirituality less, in our walk with God, it's grace alone plus faith alone in the Spirit of God alone. And the Spirit of God is going to use the Word of God in your soul. These are your two sources of inner authority and inner power. Scripture is your authority. The Holy Spirit is your power. You want authority? You want power? You have it in Christ. You have, Darren, everything that you need to live as a child of God. You have all of that in Him. Whether we use it or not, that's usually a different different story. Things that Paul once believed were his glories and his boast, they were useless in the eyes of God. Once the Holy Spirit had tilled the soil of his soul, once he was ready to lay aside every human claim to honor and power and prestige, then the grace of God was waiting to give him a true promotion. This was genuine growth into the likeness of Jesus. Paul's attitude was, listen, and this is not, this, if, if this were a different context, what he says here would be one of the greatest bragamonies of all time. You know what bragamony is? Usually they're called testimonies. Well, I was delivered from this and that, all this. I'm going to give this much. Let me, let me publicly announce how much I'm going to give. Praise God. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Blah, blah, blah. Listen, that's baby, that's baby stuff. That's baby talk. That's all that smack talk, all that stuff that people do. That's, that's baby talk. That's, it's really ridiculous. If you, if you pastor for more than 12 days, you've had more people than you can count tell you what they're going to do. Uh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do something else. Hey, man, uh, wh- whatever you need, brother, about this or that. What, I mean, just, there's all kinds of just, it's ridiculous, just jabber. I mean, it, just, it sounds like jabber after a while because, listen, there's talkers and there's doers, and, and they're not the same. There's people that just talk and talk and talk about all that they're going to do in the cause of Christ or for a body of believers or even for you as a pastor. And there's people that don't say it, they just do it. And in the end, you, you, you start, it doesn't take long to realize who's who. It, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't take a, whole long, a long time to start saying, well, these people over here or this person over here, they talk a lot of smack. But this person does and doesn't, they're not even looking for recognition or applause or approbation of any kind. They're just doing, and man, how you begin to really, really deeply 
appreciate that because that's faithfulness and it's faithfulness to God not to an organization not to a pastor not to a name not to a celebrity not to a not to a whatever a cause inside the cause of Christ but they're just faithful to their God they walk with him they love him they know that their reward one day is going to come from him and I'll take doers over talkers any day of the week and frankly so will God so will God this would have been the greatest bragamony of all time I attained it all Paul says, I was at the top of the game. I surpassed all my contemporaries. Let me show you something. Turn to Galatians chapter 1, just so you know that this is not. Marshall, turn those up a few minutes ago. Would you come kick that down where we can get some airflow? It's probably just me. I'm sure it is from standing up here, but I'm, I'm warm. By warm, I mean hot, just so that you understand the code language. Look at, look at Galatians chapter 1. This is not, there's just two verses here, but he, he I mean, he lays it out there. He lays it out there for the Galatians. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13. He said, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism. Isn't that what we just saw in Philippians as well? My previous way of life. This was written before Philippians, by the way. It's not the first place that he details this. He does it in Romans. He does it in 2 Corinthians. He talks about his background, David, and all that he's, he'd achieved and accomplished and all the uh, acclaim that was his as a Pharisee under Judaism. He, I mean, this guy was a rising star. For you, you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism. Again, he's not bragging. He's stating the fact. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age, my contemporaries, and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Then he goes on to talk about God who had called him from his birth. Listen, I'm going to tell you this. I understand, uh, I understand a little bit about what, what Paul's talking about here, and I understand experientially what he went through when he decided that the cause of Christ and that the Son of God was more important than whatever his status was in his background or his movement or his theological system. You may not understand what I'm saying, but I understand what I'm saying. And I understand what Paul's saying, and I understand what he was experiencing. I have been there, my friend, and it's not pretty on the other side of it. Realize that Paul, Joe, before his salvation, he was the rising star of the religious world. He was the shining light of Judaism. He was renowned, respected, and approved everywhere he went. Everyone paid attention to Saul of Tarsus. Then he became not just a believer in, but a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, the promised Savior of the human race, and everything changed. Everything changed. You know why? Oh, well, I've moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. That's absolutely true. My sins have been forgiven. Absolutely. I've been given eternal life and the righteousness of God. Yes, yes, yes. But do you know why everything changed for him? Because now he was engaged in the real battle. Not a battle over prominence and power for a select group of people or the wealth and control of a religious system, but the war being waged for the hearts of humanity. That battle. That's the real battle. Once again, all the word for profit, for financial gains is plural, the word for loss is singular. All of these various gains and advantages and profits of his life as a devoutly religious unbeliever are considered as one loss. And it's one loss which pales in comparison to the person of Jesus. Looking back to that bold and decisive declaration that he's just made in verse 7, that whatever things were profit to me, whatever things were human advantages in the eyes of the Judaizers, these same things I added up and have concluded as a loss, as detriment, as a disadvantage for the sake of Christ. Paul says, what is more, even more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them but rubbish. And here's his ultimate purpose. You have that I, and that's, that phrase is a uh, purpose clause in the Greek. Here's the final purpose, the reason for this radical shift in mindset. And by the way, this is a radical shift in mindset. It's as if a, a modern-day Silicon Valley tech billionaire came to Christ and decided that all of this stuff, achievements and attainments, were worthless in the eyes of God and decided to give it all away, counted as loss for the sake of the Son of God, that I may gain Christ, be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, which he had, faultless and blameless, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. He begins, verse 8, with, he begins this verse with five Greek particles to indicate the force and passion of his conviction. You can't see this in the phrase, 
what is more in the English or moreover, whatever, whatever your translation says. You can't see it in English, but you see it in the Greek. He uses five different particles to begin this verse showing his passion and the, the force and passion of his conviction. The NIV has what is more. Probably the closest we can come to a literal translation would be moreover or more emphatically, therefore, at least, even. I want you to notice something. This is a side note here, but notice the Apostle Paul. I think uh, once you've read any of his letters, just like when you hear Jesus speak, you say, that's a master teacher. When you read Paul's letters, you would say, that's a master teacher. Notice that he's not afraid of repetition. He's not afraid of repetition. And he never apologizes for having to restate or reframe something that he's taught before in the past. In fact, that's what we saw last week in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1. It's no trouble for me to write these same things to you again, implying that I have written these same things to you before. It's no trouble for me. Josh, he says, it's a safeguard for you. It's a protection for your souls. It's a safeguard because nobody gets it the first time. And frankly, of the people who do get it, only a handful believe it the first time when they get it. You need to know it, and you need to believe it. Let it shape the human soul. In fact, he doesn't, not only does he not apologize for repetition, he's going to repeat his assertion with the present middle indicative. Oh, <laughs> my eyes roll back in my head, right? Present middle indicative of Hegeomai, there it is again, H-E-G-E-O-M-A-I. I'm counting, he says, I'm looking upon, I'm considering everything a loss. Remember, zemia was a word used for the damage done to one's business by taking a loss. It occurs only four times in the New Testament. Here in verses 7 and 8, we see it twice. We also see it in Acts chapter 27, verses 10 and 21. And let me give you the context of that. Paul is speaking to the to, uh the Roman centurion and the other men that are aboard an Alexandrian ship headed for Italy and perceiving that the danger of making this trip in winter says, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous. How'd you like to have a prophet in chains on a ship? And he says, this is going to end badly, badly. It's going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. Now, this word can be translated just as we, di- just as we translated it in verse 7. Disadvantage, disadvantage, loss, disadvantage, all of this. Now, here's the, here's the, here's the grammatical point that I want to make about perfect tense, present tense. Egetomai is the same word that Paul used in verse 7 when he said, I now consider. So notice the change in tense from perfect in verse 7. I came to a point of recognition in this matter, and I stand on that conclusion to this day, to present in both places where it's used in verse 8. I keep on counting as loss. Present tense is tense... That's what? How would we describe that? It's happening now, but it's also in the Greek, it has, here's the idea. This, if, you, if you put a brackets and you were going to draw, you were going to kind of diagram what kind of action, because that's what, that's what tense means in the Greek, is action start is the German word, or kind of action. It would be a line, okay? Implying that this is ongoing, that it's in process, that this is happening, not only happening now, but that it keeps on happening. One way that we could translate some of the commands that are present tense commands in the New Testament would be keep on doing this, continually do this, never stop doing this. I mean, there's different ways we could do it, but as long as we understand that this is, this is especially, the, especially the love of one another, this is relational to the core. This is going to happen constantly. This is what we have to put into practice, etc. That's what he's saying. I keep on counting as loss as a hindrance to me every day. Not just those things that brought me applause and approbation and acclaim in the religious realm, but all things. All things. Paul kept having to learn this lesson. Kept having to apply this idea to his own life and spirituality again and again and again. And you and I will have to learn this lesson as well. We'll have to turn loose of all the distractions, deceptions, and destructions of Satan's system. And there are many. And all our advantages, Michelle, our achievements in the world over and over again if we want to be conformed to the character of our king and lay hold of service in his cause. You might ask the Spirit of God, I'm suggesting, not commanding, you might ask the Spirit of God to burn this into your soul because this is the attitude it takes to advance in the spirit's realm, to make any progress whatsoever in the plan of God. This is the attitude that it takes right here. Let me tell you something. We talked about sacrifice earlier and this idea people sacrificing for the cause of Christ, which is really ludicrous when you look at what Abba did in giving his son and what Jesus did in following the Father's plan. There's really no such thing as human sacrifice. There are things that we give up and there are hardships that we may endure, but in the end, it's going to be worth it. Let me tell you something. 
You're not ever going to give up anything. You're not going to give up anything for the cause of your Savior that God's not going to return something better a hundredfold. All of this talk about, well, I just, oh, you know, I've embraced poverty or I've done this. I've done all these different things for, for God or whatever. Listen, he, he's, he's not going to take away the illegitimate things without putting something powerful and profound that is legitimate in its, back in its place. God is not merely a God of subtraction. Right? There, is a, there is a biblical formula as far as mathematics is concerned. Mercy subtracts. It takes from us the judgment that rightfully belongs to us. Grace adds. It gives to us a righteousness that we don't deserve and can never earn on our own. Love multiplies. Love multiplies. It spreads to any and to every as the Spirit of God works in you. And truth <laughs> divides. You get that? You following that equation? Mercy subtracts. Grace adds. Love multiplies. <laughs> And truth divides. You see a problem with that? I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, you see, if is there anything wrong with that? There's, that's reality, man. You think about that. That is reality. No doubt about it. You're not going to give up anything that God's not going to return. And what he's going, and I don't, I don't mean whatever you think you're going to lay at his altar as a sacrifice for him or a, an offering to him. Our God is a God of restoration. God of restoration. Listen. Anybody in here ever experienced loss? All right. If you've been alive for more than mm, an hour or two. Are you breathing? Anybody here breathing? <sighs> Still alive? Yeah. You've experienced loss in a fallen world, and it's been profound. I don't care how old you are. At some point already, you've been hammered by the enemy with this thing called loss. It's just a part of, it's a part of life in a fallen world. Other people sin nature. Sometimes the loss is just our loved ones die and, and, and move on. You know. Sometimes people abandon us. Things happen. Many in here, including myself, have suffered physically, mentally, emotionally, sexually, abuse as, as children. And you lost innocence. You lost something valuable, a core piece of your heart, right? Violation of your body or your soul. That is heinous, heinous evil. Let's call it what it is. It's evil. By the way, we've seen a couple weeks ago I talked about spiritual abuse and how to identify it. And one of the things that needs to happen in environments, even in homes, but certainly in churches, if there is abuse, we are going to get the authorities involved, and we are going to prosecute, and that's what needs to happen. We're not covering anything up. That's what happens in religion. That's what happens in, in other places. And in your family, maybe the best thing that could happen is for your uncle or your, uh, your husband or your wife or somebody else to spend a little time in jail. I'm not talking about vengeance. I'm talking about justice. There is an authority structure that God placed us under when he put governments in place. There's a reason that there are people that investigate things like that and that there's a penalty for them. You can forgive them, and that's, and, and, and that's exactly what has to happen. What a beautiful example of the love of Jesus Christ coming through the survivors of this heinous act of evil in South Carolina. If you haven't seen that video of them, that guy on a video screen, and them in the courtroom telling him that they forgive him, and on and on. It's, I mean, only the Son of God can do that. Teach you how to forgive your enemies. Well, that's powerful stuff. But guess what? That guy deserves the death penalty. He can be forgiven by them and forgiven by God. He still deserves to die for his crimes. There's no, there's no incompatibility there. The fact that someone is forgiven or that you are forgiven doesn't mean, that's what our kids don't understand. I love you. I forgive you. Guess what? You're still grounded. There's no, there's, that's not incompatible in the least. Listen, you did the crime, you're going to do the time. I forgive you, I love you. The relationship is okay. The relationship is fine. But there's still a penalty to be paid. And that's just the way reality works. Let's don't confuse these issues. Let's don't confuse the issues. You've experienced loss, all of us, in some profound ways. God's plan, one, he's not the cause of evil. So when you think back on your life and your story and the brokenness and abuse, that is not God's fault. What he can do now and, and, and he didn't orchestrate that. The enemy did. But what he can do now is he can redeem it now. Now, at this point in time, now that you recognize and you name it. By the way, you can't forgive something unless you're willing to honestly name it. Naming is a part of the process. You can't just say, well, uh, yeah, all that, all that stuff that happened back there, it's over and done. What stuff, when, and where, and who? Until you name it and bring it into, bring it into the full light of reality, you can't disinfect it. This is what it is. There's a theologian, uh, I believe he's Serbian, who was involved in some way 
and all the atrocities either perpetrated on him and his family, or maybe he was a part of it, and he is a strong proponent of naming the evil. Let's call genocide, genocide. Let's call murder, murder. Let's call rape, rape. Let's call sexual abuse, sexual abuse. Not uh, whatever. Some bad things happen, or this or that. We name it. We name it. We are, we are honest about it. We allow it to penetrate our emotions, and we forgive it because we have been forgiven, right? We've all suffered loss. God's intention is not for you to go through life with these gaping holes in your heart. He wants to restore. This is a different kind of loss than what Paul's talking about. I realize that I'm ending on a little bit of a different note, but it's, it's a loss nonetheless. He's considering his loss. He's counting his loss. All these things that he had achieved, I'm saying the losses that you have taken in a fallen world that have bruised and battered your soul, God doesn't want you to go through the rest of your life limping with just a portion of your heart in tune with him. He wants you to be whole and to be healed. He wants to restore and to give back what the enemy has stolen from you. The enemy is a master, master thief. Listen, let me finish with this note, Marshall. I don't want to leave this one verb hanging out there, right? Again, the indicative mood of hegeomai, that's the mood that a writer would use to take the action out of the sphere of mere possibility and set it down firmly in reality. In order for Paul to advance in Abba's plan for him, in order for Paul to win the victory over everything, in order for Paul and you and I to achieve the goals set before us, he had to take up the attitude, the discipline, of considering everything but Jesus as a non-essential. That had to be his reality. Everything but Jesus is a non-essential. There's no other way to move from the cross to the crown. So while it may be hard and it may be painful and it may be difficult lesson to, a difficult lesson to apply, it's not difficult to comprehend. It's not difficult to comprehend. Everything but Jesus, his family and your family, is a non-essential. That's the first step. First step is attitude. Everything but Jesus, when I say Jesus, I include his family, the body of believers, and your family in that. Everything but that is a non-essential. The second step is action. Let go of all the non-essentials. The first step is to recognize that everything but Jesus is a non-essential. That's our attitude. That's humility. The second step is action. That's power. That's authority. And the second step of action is to let go of all the non-essentials. What do you and I have? Our job, money, material, pain that we're hanging on to, that might, be, that might be a legacy for some of us, that we're holding on to all these wounds. We are going to choke down a pound of rat poison and wait for the rats to die. And we're going to sit back and watch, like eating popcorn. We're just going to pop it in, watching for the rats to die. And the rats are going happily about their way, and nothing's happening. And I'm wondering why am I feeling sicker and sicker by the minute? Because I'm holding on to all this stuff. Is it your job? Is it your money? Is it the things you have? Is it your looks? Is it your, what are your achievements? What is all of this stuff that you've accumulated? Because if you let it, it's just going to keep on piling up like mounds of dung. That's rubbish in a kind but literal translation. It's just going to keep on piling up, and it's going to hinder you. Imagine trying to have a relationship with someone surrounded by a mountain of crap. Well, I know you're on the other side over there. I can't see you. can't smell you, but you're there. I know you're there. That's what all this junk does to keep us from Jesus. All of this stuff. Everything but Jesus is a non-essential, and we better learn how to let go of the non-essentials. I'm telling you, this message is more and more important every single day as we watch our nation, our culture, the entire world in flames of some kind or another. You'd better learn how to recognize the non-essentials and how to turn loose of them. You are going to be one miserable individual as the world comes crashing down around you. May God bless you, and may the Spirit of God drive this message home. I love you. We'll see you next time. We're going to pray up here, by the way, and we welcome you to join us. Father, we're grateful for the grace that's given us this day and for the wisdom, the great wisdom of your word. You take us from naive, immature, foolish individuals with very little sense, spiritually speaking, and you make us brilliant fools for Jesus. You give us insight, wisdom, discretion, discernment. You provide us with your spirit so that we have strength within our souls. You give us the authority of the Son of God so that we can take charge and we can, in fact, command in the spiritual realm. We can uh, live freely and boldly and responsibly as men and women of God. I pray now that the thing that would top all of this off would be the love of the Lord Jesus flowing freely through us, that we would learn how to how to speak the right words in the right way to one another, how to challenge and encourage, how to be doers 
and not talkers, just flapping our gums and smacking, but just to do when we see something that needs to be done or we know the Holy Spirit's prompting us to contact this person or do this for this person, not to question it, not to wonder, not to worry, but to do, to enter in, to act. May we live generously and love graciously because your kingdom teaches us that. We ask this in the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen and amen.